business education had its real first transformation in the late 1950s and early 1960s when two major reports were published. The first by the Ford Foundation and the second by the Carnegie Corporation being very critical of business education not developing as a scientific field. In other words, business education was seen as largely anecdotal prior to the Carnegie Corporation and Ford Foundation reports. Those foundations, those reports put business education on the same level as the social sciences, arguing that much of the techniques used in social science research could be used in business education. This had a dramatic effect on the progress or the development of knowledge in business as a profession. And I think over the last 40 years, this growth of knowledge has been amazing. There have been numerous insights. One can think of the capital asset pricing model in finance, the five forces in strategy, the ways in which we think about marketing and pricing that came from this terrific research that got unleashed after the 1960s. However, the knowing part was, as it was being emphasized, meant that there were other important aspects of what it means to be a manager that got underplayed. And so I will comment first on what I see as the gap in knowledge. And the gap in knowledge is not really a gap in knowledge, but I'll try and explain it in a, in a simple way. If I think about my left hand as no knowledge, don't know anything about how to address a problem. And if I think about my right hand as the full information I need in order to address a problem, a large amount of what business education did as it moved from the 1960s post Ford and Carnegie Found Corporation reports was to move my left hand as knowledge kept progressing to understanding more and more about what it is that I need in order to address a problem. Of course, we are well aware that the knowledge does not move to such an extent that all the information I need to solve a problem is available to a manager. That is because by definition, the challenges a manager faces is context dependent, contingent, affected by human interactions, affected by cultures, affected by context. And so, invariably, there is a gap. Now, what Rethinking the MBA argues is rather than thinking about only pushing the left hand towards the right and trying to continue to develop knowledge, which we must do, can we look at the problem in a different way and indeed look at the problem from the right side. And of course, if you look at the problem from where my right hand is, now you see a gap. You see that when faced with a problem, managers will not have all the information they need to address a problem. And what rethinking the MBA challenges us to think about is, is it possible for us to train students to be comfortable in the gap? Is it possible for us to train students to think about how they will make decisions when they do not have all the information available to them? Is it possible to have students think about how to think critically through what is important? Is it possible to have students think integratively about what are the various elements that need to come together for them to uh, make decisions? Is it possible for students to think more innovatively about, when, about a problem when you know you do not really have all the information that you would like to have in order to address this? So it is this comfort with ambiguity, lack of structure, uh, the need to work even though you do not have all the information that I think is very important for us to focus on. And there have been some 
wonderful courses developed that actually help students get comfortable in the gap. The second example I'd give on rethinking the MBA refers to what I earlier described as the knowing doing gap. That what you know is quite different from what you can actually do with that knowledge. And unless you can actually do things with the knowledge that you have, you know, as a professional, it doesn't serve our purpose to only have students who can analyze, who are only analytical, who understand what the problems are, we need people who can act, we need people who can get things done. And so, simple example of uh, taking something like uh, marketing and the statement that we sort of uh, allude to in the book is that if you haven't ever really sold anything to anybody at any time, your ability to understand marketing, your ability to understand what is it that you need to deliver to a customer is severely limited. So if we take these doing skills seriously, then it means giving business school students the opportunity to practice what it is that we are teaching in our classrooms, to engage in experiential learning. And we argue in the book that this is an important aspect of management education that Indian business schools ought to think about. I'll take another example, that of innovation. Almost everyone you talk to says that the countries, companies that are going to be the most successful going forward are those that have the capacity to innovate. So how do companies innovate? How do people think more creatively? How do people solve problems in more innovative ways? Well, in our research, we learned that innovation is really what I might call a doing skill. And we only half jokingly refer to it and it's, uh, that it's very similar to or the how you learn innovation is very similar to how you learn how to swim, for instance. None of us would argue that the best way to learn how to swim is to give someone a book and ask them to read it, make sure they get an A grade on it, and then they'll be expert swimmers. So how do we learn swimming? Well, there's only one very well-established way to do it. You go into the pool, you kick your feet around, someone corrects how you do things, and you slowly, through repeated practice, develop that skill. We believe that helping someone think more innovatively, think more creatively, only comes about through repeated practice. And if we in our MBA programs haven't given the students the opportunity to practice those skills, it's very hard for them to then get these skills developed as they go into the workplace. It's like going into competition when you haven't had any practice. And of course, that's a very intimidating uh, thought. So I really think that business schools in India, indeed, this is a common finding across the world, ought to be paying a lot more attention to action learning, paying a lot more attention to doing, paying a lot more attention to experiential learning, paying a lot more attention to how do you practically get things done. And in schools that have actually done that, uh, we have a tremendous opportunity to increase the confidence of our students that they can take the learnings that they have received in our programs and actually successfully implement them in practice. The last piece of rethinking the MBA that I'd like to emphasize is what we labeled as being skills. Being skills are the values and attitudes that uh, managers bring to their work. Being skills is the ability to influence others. Being skills is the ability to understand others, to listen carefully to different points of view. Because at the end of the day, what distinguishes management from other professions, let's say like medicine or like architecture, 
is that a manager is only successful if he or she can make ordinary people around him or her do extraordinary things. So how can we train our students to influence others, to have others gain a lot of confidence, to mentor others, to inspire others, to motivate others? Because at the end of the day, as a manager, those are deeply important skills that managers ought to have. And so I believe MBA programs need to have students be much more reflective, much more self-aware, much more understanding of the role of business in society, much more able to relate to others very different from themselves. And in the process, be able to lead teams, work with in teams in ways that achieves the organization's goals. So again, if I come back to the core ideas in Rethinking the MBA, it says that of course we ought to know, have students who know, because knowledge is the basis of any profession. But beyond knowing, we need to know to teach our students how to think, how to be comfortable in what I refer to as the gap. In order to do that, you have to actually be able to do something, take action. But it's very hard for you to take action successfully unless you are aware about the impact that your actions have on others and indeed in an organization it's very hard to take action by yourself. You've got to have others take action for which you are willing to be accountable and responsible. And so knowledge is important, but that's only the foundation. What I do with that knowledge and how I act with that knowledge is what doing skills are that I think we need to emphasize a whole lot more. And then the doing skills only become real, only become actionable if a manager has focused on being. So then if we don't do any being, it's hard for me to see how there'll be much doing. And if we don't do much doing, it's hard for me to see how all the knowledge that we are giving our students would be of great value. And so we think about knowing, doing, and being as the three core elements where each of these need more work. But certainly I would hope that MBA programs would focus much more heavily on being and on doing. In my uh, description of the book in India, I always uh, try and connect some of these ideas to a person who I've always thought of as a great hero of mine, always continues to be a great hero of mine, Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhiji, as you know, had his seven deadly sins. And I feel that I wish we would pay more attention to three of his very deadly sins that I think are directly applicable in management and in management schools. So I won't talk about uh, wealth without work or worship without sacrifice or politics without principle and pleasure without conscience. Those were Gandhi's four of his seven, but the next three directly apply. So he would talk about one deadly sin, sin being commerce without morality. That's really a question of being. How do we act ethically? How do we take actions that are in the larger good of society. Second was science without humanity. And of course, if you think about management as only being a science and ignore the human aspects of management, that then causes, I think, severe uh, a, a lack of real impact in organizations. And the last of them, of course, that I would cite is uh, knowledge without character. And his concern that if you give someone knowledge, but at the same time don't build their character, it ends causing society and the organizations they lead no end of trouble. So in a very simple way, rethinking the MBA is really about going back to those basic truths that we want to develop leaders and entrepreneurs who will act and in so doing contribute to their societies.